Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi <laughs> so I'm here on my phone, which isn't quite as easy as my laptop, so I'll put it a little bit further away. Sure, that's fine. So long as we can see Doug, I think that should be good. <laughs> Hi, Doug. <laughs> oh, my. Has he had a long day today? <laughs> Um, well, no, it's only lunchtime, really, but he's, um, he's ready for a little snooze. Okay. Yeah. He looks really comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. It's so, so great to have you, Kate. Oh, well, um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, so, you know, hello, everyone. Thank you, viewers, for uh, tuning into Dog Spots live session today. My name is Yamika Dhamani, and uh, I'm a founder of a pet food company called Clever Canine in Bangalore. Uh, so I truly am really passionate about pets uh, and it's so great to be here connecting with, you know, like-minded individuals who also um, really love pets and do so much for them and, you know, working with them. Uh, so, you know, we have a very, very special guest joining us today, um, all the way from London, UK. Um, he's an extraordinary dog named Doug the Pug, um, featured in the UK TV series Dogs with Incredible Jobs. Uh, what is his incredible job? Well, he's a therapy dog and he has almost 10 years of experience, um, you know, giving service to people. So, um, you know, wow, I just, wow. <laughs> it's so great to have you guys here. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for valuing all that we share. <laughs> That's great. So, uh, so Doug the Pug is joined by his super mom, Kate Archer. Um, and, uh, you know, we're... Uh, as we get more viewers uh, pouring in, um, I'm just going to, you know, quickly do some more of an introduction uh, for the newcomers. Uh, so, um, Doug the Therapy Dog and his mom, Kate Archer, um, are joining us all the way from the UK. And um, Doug started off his career in 2011 at the age of one and a half years old, right, yeah. Kate? Mm -hmm. Great. So now he is, how old is he right now? Um, Doug's ten and a half now. He's ten and a half. Okay. Yeah. But look at him. I mean, he looks young as ever. <laughs> oh, little silver fox beard. <laughs> He's had very hard George Clooney. It's really mm -hmm. hardly noticeable. Um, I think... Uh, you know, I must really tell you, I think he's probably the sweetest and most affectionate dog I've ever seen, Kate. Um, oh. And you know, I'm just reading about the kind of work that he does and that you guys do is just amazing. And it's really heartwarming. Um, so he absolutely must love his job, right? Yes. And I think that that's really important too. And the assessments that we had through Pets as Therapy to ensure that um, Doug had the right temperament to do the job are twofold in the way that they had to establish that he was never going to react negatively to any sounds or actions coming his way, but also that he was going to be welcoming and receptive to the attention that he was going to receive in his work. Right. So he yeah. has to enjoy it too. It's easy for me to say that I want to do it, but he has to enjoy it too. Yeah, and you know that must take a special kind of dog uh, to do this kind of work as well. Yes, because you know we often work with people who... Um, maybe have quite challenging mental health problems or children who have particularly learning differences. So, you know, Doug has to be receptive to lots of people approaching him in different ways. Right, right. And he's so patient. I can just see um, him <laughs> sitting in your arms. <laughs> he, he really knows his job well. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's very patient. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so, you know, before we go on talking about um, his journey, um, could you just share a little bit about, um, you know, how you started your journey off? And, um, you know, so I think you grew up in a farm. Am I right? I did. Yeah. So okay. growing up in a farm in the middle of nowhere, I was used to having animals and always had many animals, you know, working animals and companion animals always around us. So we grew up in a house with lots of dogs and cats. And then, you know, moving to London, I found it really hard not having a dog. So um, I had quite a few years without any companion animals and, and really, really missed that connection. I feel that the human animal bond is incredibly healing and, and very heartwarming for us. So um, 15 years ago, we got um, our big dog, Molly, and she's a chocolate Labrador. And being 15 years old, I'm surprised that she hasn't calmed down, but she hasn't. She's still my wild child. 
<laughs> and she's just beautiful and gorgeous and loving, but very bouncy. She would she would never have passed the assessments to be a therapy dog because she's just mm -hmm. too too strong in her spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we got Doug, who's always been an incredibly soppy soul, we just knew that he'd be perfect. Yes, definitely. He is perfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. And his size as well, right? Um, well, so. but then, you know, big dogs make lovely therapy dogs too, because some mm -hmm. people um, warm more to a big dog and some people like having the dog's ha head on their lap rather than, you know, their whole being. So mm -hmm. the lovely thing about the organisation that we volunteer through, Pets as Therapy, they don't discriminate in any way with any dog or crossbreed. It's entirely based on the temperament of the animal. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So, um, so you know, uh, just to know, uh, what are the traits or characteristics that uh, you would need to have to be a therapy dog? Um, and how is dog different from other dogs out there? Well, as I explained with Molly, she's very spirited and very bouncy. And that would be quite disconcerting for somebody who is hesitant or poorly or um, particularly frail in any way. Mm -hmm. So um, a prospective therapy dog needs to be incredibly calm and very quiet. So Doug doesn't bark. He doesn't make a lot of noise. Uh, he doesn't jump up. Mm -hmm. um, he allows people to come to him without him being over enthusiastic about greeting them. So that's really good. Um, also, a dog with Petra's therapy must walk very gently on a lead without pulling. Mm -hmm. So be, appear to be in total command of the owner that um, the dog is with, right. rather than fighting against that. Um, mm -hmm. No jumping up, because that could actually be quite dangerous with someone very frail. Um, yes. And no licking. Um, Doug's not allowed <laughs> to kiss when he's at work. <laughs> um, but why, why no licking? Is there a reason for that? Um, it's just not good hygienic practice, really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, so what are the kind of people that uh, Doug works with? I know that he works with, um, you know, right from children to adults and elderly people. Um, but if you could just share a bit more about the profile of people that he works with typically? Um, well, we work in schools on a pets as therapy reading program called Read to Dogs. And there, Doug helps the children regain a love of learning in a really lovely, safe, non-threatening environment. So the children read to the dog. And unlike most humans, he doesn't interrupt or correct. Um, and he allows the children to regain their love of learning in a really safe, non-threatening environment where they're not going to be nervous about being chastised in any way or being overcorrected. Mm -hmm. um, so that's lovely for them to gain their confidence. And as the children gain their confidence in reading and become more proficient in their reading, they gain more confidence and they put their hand up in class much more often. They contribute right across the curriculum with much, much more ease. And then they become more socially able in the, in the playground and they just have a much more confident childhood and feel more significant members of society. Right, that's, then, that's really good. Yeah, so sometimes the children that have learning differences that they're really struggling with, it might be that they're just particularly shy, or it might be that they've lost confidence through being overcorrected. Or yeah. it may be that they're particularly able children and they're trying to push themselves too far um, without actually consolidating a breadth of learning before mm -hmm. that you know, they're ready to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then other children we work with have significant learning differences where actually just engaging and getting reaction and um, just bonding with them is, is very important. Mm -hmm. And we work with children who've been excluded from school because of their behavioral challenges. Okay. So getting children to take ownership of their own challenges and their own behaviors enables them to just work within a group environment with much more ease. Mm -hmm. And rather than being another adult on their case, we can say to a child, how you're behaving at the moment, how do you think that that makes Doug feel? And do you think mm -hmm. he'll feel safe in your care? Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to be with Doug, it's entirely your choice, but you need to talk to Doug and talk to him about what sort of behaviors you need to illustrate so that he can feel safe with you, just like you need to feel safe with him. Yes. And children then sometimes say, well, 
okay, I need to stop shouting because I don't think Doug likes that very much. And mm -hmm. maybe if I stop kicking my arms and legs around, that'll make Doug feel that he's not going to get hit. Mm -hmm. And we can say, well, that's good. You know, reflecting on all of those different behaviours that aren't good is a really great way for you to share with Doug what is good. And then that means that we haven't chastised the child further or made them feel as if they're completely cornered um, mm -hmm. and being got at again. Mm -hmm. So those are um, some of the young people we work with, but also we've worked in a hostel for families who've lost their homes. And it may be that some of those families have fled a relationship that's been unhealthy for them and ended up in the hostel. So some of those children are finding it really hard because everything in their life has completely been turned upside down and everything's changed. So seeing Doug allows them a bit of grounding, but also it means that some behaviours that they illustrate um, can't just be up in the air, that when they're with Doug, they always have to behave the same, that Doug has very required calm set behaviors that he will work with and i need to make sure that i'm his voice and i'm his advocate to make sure that that happens so again with children who've had very very unhappy and chaotic lives it's good for them to be able to think and reflect upon their own behaviors before being with doug and yes, some of the I children we work with some of the children we've worked with don't have any positive physical contact in their life and that's really hard for children who've been mm -hmm. um, in difficult situations so learning mm -hmm. to physically engage with Doug and enjoy the physical contact that he offers is a really great way for children to re regain a love of actually being physically touched in a very positive way and we hope that then that mm -hmm. they'll be able to go on and form and sustain physical relationships in later life yeah and that and boils adults. down to um yeah yeah no, and then Sorry. there are all other other age groups we work with too in different settings so um mm -hmm. we work with young adults who have mental health challenges and um okay. they really enjoy being with doug because often if people are feeling lacking in confidence that they don't want to be in a position where somebody's going to be intrusive and asking questions that um, make them feel cornered so anyone who's perhaps finding it really difficult to socially reintegrate because of their mental health challenges, then um, they can engineer a conversation that sort of goes through Doug and is about Doug. So they know that we're not going to have any conversations that are going to put them on the spot or make them feel awkward or difficult in any way. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really wonderful. Yes. Doug won most heroic hound for supporting mental health and emotional well-being at um, the National Pet Show in England um, four years ago. Wow, that's, so, that's amazing. Congratulations to Doug. <laughs> and then we work with elderly people too um, in a care home. And that's very yeah. different again because they're, um, we work with a lot of people who have dementia. So um, they find that the socialisation is really hard for them because they feel quite isolated in conversations. They don't know how to contribute to a conversation and then they become quite withdrawn. Mm -hmm. But when they talk to Doug, they can talk about the dog that they had in their past and, and draw from memories that they've, you know, had in a, a dim and distant past that um, sometimes with dementia patients, their long-term memory is quite mm -hmm. sharp compared mm -hmm. with their short-term memory. And also just, you know, the physical engagement Older people, often on their own without a physical relationship, mm -hmm. um, often don't get a hug. So having a little yeah. snuggle with Doug is really nice. Yeah, it is. And, you know, that can go a really long way to make them feel better. And yeah. that's, yeah. that's really wonderful. That's so great. So what's a day in uh, Doug's life like? You know, like Well, <laughs> it, depends, it depends where we're going. So clearly at the moment... Um, because of lockdown, um, all pet therapy visits have been completely suspended. So at the yeah. moment, um, the things that we're doing are mainly online. So this afternoon, we have mm -hmm. a Zoom meeting with um, the young adults in the mental health provision that we go to. And that's mm -hmm. lovely because some of them are feeling particularly isolated, maybe in a high rise flat without any outdoor space. So mm -hmm. seeing a new face and just engaging with somebody who's 
very familiar with them and they can feel really safe in a conversation with, then that goes well too. But um, yes, and we've been doing some video reading sessions with children too. But when it's not um, lockdown in the outside world, when we're allowed out and part of things, um, we go to different places, you know, all the time. So Doug doesn't work every day. He'll maybe have two or three engagements each week. Um, okay. And, uh, and recently, before lockdown, we went to see um, someone in hospital. Doug isn't a regular hospital visitor, but if somebody that he knows very well through another establishment is in hospital, we try and go and see them. And that man was at the very end of his life, which was really hard for him, his family, and for us too. And... Um, we went to see him in hospital and Doug just lay with them on his bed and the two of them just slept together for two hours. And the doctor said it was the most restorative sleep that that guy had had for all the time he'd been in hospital. So even though it felt that he wasn't really engaging with Doug, that they'd slept, mm -hmm. they had actually been spooning and he had been running his fingers through Doug's fur. Uh -huh. And he didn't know I was there, but he could feel and recognize Doug. And the fact that he'd actually calmed down and was less fretful and had some restorative sleep um, was incredibly comforting for the staff who knew what awful times that man had been through before we arrived. So that was really heartwarming to know that sometimes even though when we can't see the difference that's being made, other people can. Mm -hmm. That's that's absolutely right. And um, I think, you know, they say that uh, pets or dogs can also um, really sense, you know, people being sick. Um, and, it, you know, I think that's true for dog as well. Like he, he would really know what's going on, you know, physiologically with someone yeah. who is under. Yeah, I can see that in the way that he relates to people in different ways that um, when we're at home, he doesn't look at now, but he's incredibly lively and bouncy and um, plays around. But in a working environment, he seems to intuitively know when he needs to be incredibly quiet and gentle and let somebody come to him. Right. So he can adapt to the situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that, as you say, you know, they are intuitive, they do know. And um, that connection with the human-animal bond is really, it's very precious. It's very special. It is. It, it definitely is. And I think, you know, a lot of people just having a pet at home, they may not be a therapy dog. Um, but that itself in itself is, you know, such a positive experience, just having a pet dog or a cat at mm. home for regular people as well. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's really true. So pets as therapy do have cats as well. It's mostly mm -hmm. dogs, but there are therapy cats as well. But mm -hmm. as you say, you know, all of our companion animals are therapy animals, really. There's a lovely saying that I came across on social media that, um, all our companion animals are therapy animals. It's just that most of them are working undercover. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Mm. Um, and they don't get paid for it, per se. Oh, <laughs> but, but that's um, Doug. So Doug only works for love and kindness. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, uh, that's truly, you know, unconditional uh, love. And that's, that's really so amazing. I think all, all dogs are like that, right? They don't really want anything uh, materialistic in return. Um, just... Our affection, uh, I think, is good enough to... It's a rewarding experience for them yeah. as well. So you've just had a lovely kiss there. Who's that from? Yes. <laughs> this is Stella. So she's uh, she's my American bully. She's <laughs> so beautiful. She's just come for some treats. <laughs> really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, she's it's really great having her. And, uh, you know, she's helped me through some hard times as well. You know, just being around like they don't even need to say anything or do anything no. but i think just having dogs around like you could be having a low point um or just having a sad day or a bad day and mm. um, you know just uh, being around them can really make a difference and that's so true that you know often you don't want to be alone but you don't want to communicate you don't want the effort of talking to somebody about why you're not feeling well yeah. what you're going to do about it and yeah. dogs just don't expect anything in return they're just there for you at the level that works best for us yes exactly they don't really expect anything in in return just um that's it's so it's such a simple relationship that it we is. share with them. 
Really? And I think that's what makes it therapeutic, right? Yeah. That it's simple and um, it's, you know, silent. There's no talking. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's so true. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Doug loves his work and, you know, loves doing what he's doing and he's so good at it. Um, but, you know, how do you know when he's maybe getting stressed or tired or, you know, uh, maybe needs a break? Uh, sometimes does he ever go on vacation um yes yeah, so he, he doesn't fly he doesn't have a passport <laughs> okay um, but we spend a lot of time in the northeast of england on the beach okay um so wow. the life that we have between london and the countryside is really really nice um okay. so he has a lot of freedom there but there are lovely you know outdoor parks in london so he has a particularly lovely life really but yeah, looks when like Doug it. is stressed, um, his little curly tail unravels and goes quite straight. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you can also tell from a pug's ears when they're unhappy. Okay. So if some, there's only one time that we've ever been in a working environment where I could tell from Doug's posture that he was actually unhappy. Okay. Um, and the rest of the time, I can anticipate when something might get to that level and I'm, I'm able to withdraw Doug before that. Mm-hmm. But it was when a child was behaving particularly badly, but it was understandable because our life was going through a lot of trauma. Um, and so I was able to pick Doug up and withdraw him and say to her, you know, I'm really sorry. I know that you're a gorgeous girl, but because of how you're behaving just at this minute, mm-hmm. Doug isn't feeling safe in your care. Mm-hmm. So we're actually going to go away for a few minutes. And when we come back, mm-hmm. you can decide, you can make the choices for yourself, whether you'd like to yeah. be with Doug or not. Mm-hmm. But if you'd like to be with Doug and you choose to do that, you need to talk to Doug about how you're going to behave so that he doesn't feel mm-hmm. like he is at the moment. Yeah, sure. And th- that in itself is a lesson for you know children like her to learn. It's an easy way to explain um, something, a concept like that to them. Yeah. And it was a great way of not chastising in any way, but just getting her to reflect and take ownership um, sure. with her own behaviours. And sure. um, and we always, you know, do that with um, anyone with learning differences or any young people that we'll say, you know, these are the things that Doug doesn't like. So mm-hmm. Doug doesn't like his nose being booped. And people okay. are quite tempted to boop a dog on the nose. Yeah. Doug sure. doesn't like his face being touched. He's mm-hmm. never going to react negatively to it. It's just that he's not going to be welcoming of it. Right. So you know, the, the pets as therapy assessments make sure that a dog is never going to react negatively to being touched in any way, mm-hmm. whether it's his ears, his tail, his feet, right. his genitalia, in oh. case that gets touched by mistake. But, mm-hmm. you know, as with us all, there are certain things that we don't really like. And if I went to touch his nose, he would just pull away. So if somebody wants engagement with Doug, they know yeah. that there are particular behaviours that they're not going to enable they're not going to have that engagement if they touch him in a way that he doesn't like being touched sure yeah so it's that that feedback system um between doug and the people that he works with uh which i think goes a long way um to helping them with some of their problems as well yeah 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 i think uh, i think dog body language if you know it and you understand it um they're they're communicating with us all the time and it's so beautiful to watch them Yes. And it's lovely for, um, we work with children who have learning differences. Mm -hmm. You know, some children we work with have no voice. Mm -hmm. And um, in Doug's book, we were talking about how um, we all communicate in different ways and and we must learn to recognize that. So we sometimes work with children to say, show me your cross face, show me your happy face, show me your sad posture. So you know, we practice slumping our shoulders and our head being down and show how, how our whole being becomes sad looking. Mm-hmm. And say, just like us, our dogs communicate in many, many different ways. And we, ne- we need to learn to read each other as well as read our dogs. Yes. So, um, and then valuing and respecting that our friends who don't have a voice, who perhaps are nonverbal, mm-hmm. then the way that they communicate with other people, whether that's through sign language or body language or a combination of them both, we need to respect and value that just like we do with our companion animals. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, that's, that's so true. So w- what is this book that you mentioned about, Kate? So, 
Um, I wrote a book um, called Doug the Pug, A Working Dog's Tale. Okay. And it's about Doug's, it's about Doug and his life as a working therapy dog. And um, it's written as a, a story about what he does and where he goes. And then there's quite an educational learning um, direct section at the back to build on empathetic learning and help consolidate the emotional and social messages that we've incorporated within mm -hmm. our book. So um, the book, um, the royalties all go back to the charity Pets of Therapy that we both volunteer through. Yes. And um, it's, it's a lovely tale, um, just encouraging us all to value who and what we are and recognize that we all have differences that should be celebrated. We hear an awful lot about tolerance and tolerating each other, yeah. but mm -hmm. actually celebrating the differences that we all hold is what real, true inclusivity is always about. And, um, and also the fact that everyone we meet has something wonderful to offer. It's, um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to look quite hard for that, but yes. if we work mm -hmm. hard enough with people, we'll always find something that is either common ground or something that we value, respect, that may take a little while to get to know. Absolutely. That's, that sounds just truly, truly amazing. And, um, you know, where can we buy that book? I mean, I definitely want to own a copy of that. Well, it is for sale on Amazon, but unfortunately, okay. they've racked up the price. Okay. Um, so if anybody contacts me via my website, dougthepugtherapydog.com, mm -hmm. and if they send me a screenshot to say that they've donated five pounds to Pets of Therapy, I will send them a copy. Wow, that's that's just really amazing. So I hope that all our viewers heard that, um, you know, we're, you guys can get uh, your hands on a copy of the book. And that is just truly amazing. Thank you so much for um, for that, Kate. That's, that's really nice of you. Um, it's really like selfless and that's amazing. Like all the work you do is just so truly amazing. Thank you. <laughs> And, and so this book that uh, you wrote, is it intended for a certain audience, like uh, children, or is it just intended for anyone to read? Well, it's a children's book, really, for children, so primarily for the age of maybe um, seven to ten. But okay. um, my publishers actually categorize it as an academic book because mm -hmm. of the learning directives um, in the back and the social and emotional messages that it all shares. But... It's, it's basically a, a, a story, but it's written in such a way that after the first couple of pages, each double page spread stands alone. So it's accessible by many people of different abilities and different age groups. So okay. if somebody just read the first three pages and then the last four, they wouldn't affect the fluidity of the tale. And if mm -hmm. they felt that any pages in the middle were just too wordy, they could mm -hmm. just skip them without it actually missing out in any way. Okay. And then sometimes... Um, Teachers might use a particular double page spread that um, talks about a particular difference or a learning curve of, of the little one that they're working with. or um, And they might just then use that page for a morning assembly at school or um, a, a social and emotional class that they're going to be working with. So um, all of the examples and pages in the book are based on Doug's true working life as a therapy dog, just woven into a story in a very discreet way. That's wonderful. So he truly is famous. Uh, he has a book. He's been on TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he's won awards. That's just, you know, you must be such a proud mom. I am. I really am. <laughs> you know, being part of Pets as Therapy is a really, truly wonderful organization. And the love that we share through them is fabulous. I'm really... I really love it. And we've been part of that charity now for over nine years. And mm -hmm. I'm so glad that we are. That's just truly amazing. Um, so, so Kate, you know, before you got into, um, you know, being Doug's mom and before he was a therapy dog, um, what were you doing? Like, were you um, working with other dogs, um, therapy dogs, or has he just been no, the I... behind all your work now? <laughs> well, I did work um, with children with additional learning differences. Mm -hmm. So I taught literacy and numeracy to children okay. who had um, okay. difficulties in their learning. And okay. um, that put me in a position where 
I understood so much, but it doesn't make me any better at being a volunteer with Pets as Therapy than other empathetic dog owners. So there are no, um, there are no needs like that to become a volunteer and do what we do. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and now that I'm retired, that I have a lot of time to share, really. That's great. I mean, you and dog are just, you know, so perfect together, <laughs> changing lives. Yeah, and it's lovely because we often work with um, very big dogs. So Pets as Therapy base their assessments for qualification truly and primarily on the behavior of the individual dog. So um, even though Doug's very little and snuggly, he's no better at doing what he does than a Great Dane or a Labrador or a Spaniel if they had the right back the right temperament. Mm -hmm. So um, the assessments through the charity Pets as Therapy that we volunteer through, everything is based on the temperament assessments. So mm -hmm. crossbreeds and of all different shapes and sizes can make very good therapy dogs. And that's mm -hmm. so lovely because we can actually put that into practice with children as well by saying that it doesn't matter how big we are or how small we are or what color we are. Everything really matters about the love that we share from within. Yes, I couldn't agree more with that. And that's, it's really great that, you know, you guys are representing that in, your, in the work mm -hmm. that you do. Yeah, so. it's lovely that we can. <laughs> um, so, Kate, we have a couple of questions coming in from some of our viewers. So if you yeah. wouldn't mind, um, can I take some of those questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Pixie Duster, Ted Star, says, um, what has been your most rewarding experience with Doug while on duty as a therapy dog? So, any examples of people that he's worked with, which has really, you know, touched your heart? Well, there are a few, really. Um, so if anybody watched Dogs with Incredible Jobs, it was a, a Channel 5 program that Doug and I were on a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is actually on Doug's website in the press section mm -hmm. if anybody can't access it. Um, that was a really beautiful moment that was illustrated in the um, young lady that Doug worked with at the mental health unit. Mm -hmm. um, and she was the reason why Doug got to go there, that um, when she started going to the mental health provision um, her engagement worker said to her there you know when you were at your most challenged time with your mental health difficulties what was it that actually got you up in the morning and what made you feel able to carry on going and being part of things and she said it was her cat really that she knew that she had to get up and engage with her cat and she had to get dressed and go out so that she could get food for her cat so yeah. Her cat, the relationship and the obligation that she had to her companion animal yeah. was really very, very important for her journey for recovery. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, she was given the task of finding a, a companion animal therapy um, dog for the, um, or a cat, but it was a dog for the um, mental health unit. So that's really lovely. Mm -hmm. um, but there was another time when Doug and I worked in a special needs school. And there was a young lady who came to school every morning, very distressed, really, yeah. really distressed. And she wouldn't tell the teachers or her parents why she was distressed, but it was, it was destroying her family because every day that she was left at school, she was so traumatized and it was really very upsetting. Um, she did have substantial learning difficulties, but that doesn't make it any easier for her parents to see her un unhappy. And I asked her if she would share with me what it was that made her so frightened to come to school. And she wouldn't. She wouldn't tell me at all. And I asked her if she would tell Doug. And she said, no, Doug would be too scared. And I said, you know, Doug won't be scared. He's actually really sad to know that you're really this unhappy every single morning coming to school. Okay. And we would like to be able to help you in some way so that when you come, you aren't so frightened. Okay. And she said, it's him. I don't know where he is and I don't like to see him and I don't know where he is every morning when I come, but I don't want to see him. And she was very agitated. Okay. And I felt I had a duty of care to say, who? I couldn't lead the conversation by saying, is it the physiotherapist? Is it the caretaker? Is it yes. whatever? Because yes. you yes. must never lead children by putting words in their mouths. Mm -hmm. 
and I just said, who? who? Who are you frightened of? Who don't you like being here? And she said, it's him. And I said, but who is he? And she said, the wolf. And I said, the wolf? And she said, yes. You know that wolf that chased that lovely little girl in a red coat through the woods when she was on her way to see her granny? And I said, yes, Little Red Riding Hood. And he, she said, yes. And also the wolf, I bet it's the same one, the same wolf, I bet you, who chased those three little pigs out of their home when they'd only left their mommy the week before. And I said, the three little pigs. And she said, yes. And where else is he? Which other books is he in? She said, and I never know where those books are going to be. Whenever I come to school, they're in a different place every day and I don't know where I'm going to find them. Aww. And I don't know where else this wolf is in which other books. Then she looked at Doug and said, why is Doug not scared? <laughs> and I said, because he knows they're pretend stories and he's not frightened of anything that's pretend. So she made us go in for some extra sessions and we went through all of the books that were in her classroom library and mm -hmm. she would look at Doug to see if he was scared. And then Doug went to story time. And after that, when she realized that the wolf was just pretend and she knew which books he was in and which books he wasn't in, mm -hmm. um, she stopped screaming when she went to school in the mornings and it completely changed the lives of the whole family. It gave them all their lives back. Mm -hmm. And the parents could go off to work not feeling absolutely exhausted and up against it by their daughter being so frightened. And that just came about through her being prepared to tell Doug something that she wouldn't yes. tell anybody. Else. Yes. And you know, that's, that's so important because dogs are so non judgmental. And, and I think that that really helps people to, to heal through uh, whatever they're going through. Yeah. Is that dogs, um, they just, they, they don't judge. <laughs> no. So, you know, they don't interrupt yeah. and they don't correct. Yes. So she knew that she had a platform to talk to Doug. Um, they are non-judgmental. There was no way that Doug was going to think that's really silly to be worried about such a silly thing. You know, yeah. if it was genuine worry to her, then it's real. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how ridiculous any adult thinks it yeah. is. If it's genuine and real for the child, then it's genuine and real. And as yeah. you say, Doug isn't going to stand in judgment of that. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Our dogs, they hold no judgment and hold no stigma. And we should all think more like a dog, really, shouldn't we? Yes, um, I think we definitely need to speak less. <laughs> Sometimes we just, you know, force our opinions on other people. Um, and, and that's not always good for certain people in certain environments. And also, um, dogs are so comfortable with silence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we feel lacking in confidence and we feel awkward and we feel that we need to fill the space with conversation just so that we don't feel awkward. Yes. Basically, dogs never feel awkward when they're just sitting in silence. Mm -hmm. They're just there, just enjoying just being. Yes, exactly. Just like dog is doing right now. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Has he had enough for today? <laughs> Oh, no, he's fine. He's, he's got his lovely little chin rest, so he's fine. <laughs> yes, he looks so comfortable, so comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, Kate, can you just tell us, um, so I was watching the TV series um, on, on Doug, the episode from Dogs with Incredible Jobs, and, um, and I noticed that, you know, they talk about uh, Doug and his uh, journey where he had cancer. So would you be comfortable talking about, you know, um, how he got through it? Yeah, so Doug had a mast cell tumour. Um, and they're very common in all breeds of dogs, but they're mm -hmm. quite difficult to find. So it just looked like a very raised, hard pimple. Mm -hmm. And I only saw it really because his, it was on his head and his hair slightly parted. And okay. I looked to see why his hair was parting and I could see this little spot. It was just like a tiny, tiny little baby pee really mm -hmm. and um, so I took him to the vet and they said you know keep an eye on it and I went away thinking actually I don't want to just keep an eye on it that I wasn't mm -hmm. comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. and then it just went away and then okay. it came back again and apparently that's one of the biggest indications of it being malignant is okay. when it changes so right. any, anything that we have that changes um, is a sign of concern. 
So mm -hmm. I did get it taken off. So he had surgery under general anaesthetic and had quite a big scar across the back of his head. Oh. And he had the growth taken away. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately, I got it taken away when it was early enough to get really good margins and he didn't need any further treatment. Okay. That, was, that was four years ago now. So um, it's really good that um, because I was vigilant and I was aware of um, just keeping an eye on it and mm -hmm. making sure that I didn't just leave it, mm -hmm. it was taken away. Some people aren't as fortunate because they are very difficult to detect. So I'm yes. not saying that anybody who has a higher grade tumor that needs treatment has been neglectful in any way because they can appear really horrifyingly quickly and sometimes they grow inside before they grow outside which yes. is very hard so it's just you know we need to be ever vigilant really mm -hmm. and that's the dilemma because you know dogs can't speak and so <laughs> you know they probably detect that they're sick but you know they can't really communicate it to us so yeah. it's our duty to really you know keep an eye out and and know our dogs well enough to to see that there's something different and i but, think that grooming a dog regularly and handling them well mm -hmm. and stroking them and, and having very close contact means that you're very familiar with how they hold themselves if they have a change in demeanor or posture but also you know having a dog that's handled a lot you can feel things that just don't mm -hmm. feel as they did before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh yes exactly um so even i feel my dog stella's i know every inch of her body <laughs> yeah uh, so if there's a change you know um I'll, I'll definitely like click a picture send it to my vet um you know maybe take her to the vet or something like that yeah yeah and if you have a vet that isn't accommodating of that then think again about whether you feel that that's the right vet for you yes mm. exactly that's so true. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, speaking of Doug's, um, you know, battle with cancer, uh, I also saw that he worked with somebody who had cancer. Does he often work with um, cancer patients? Um, not very often, but um, you're talking about the young lady in the television yes. program. And yes. she's the one who brought Doug to the mental health unit. So Doug and her have very, very special bond together. So mm -hmm. Deborah was the reason that Doug started use, working at the mental health unit and um, the fact that they both had cancer and they're both really well and in good, good health. So we're still very much in touch with Deborah and she's doing really well. So that's really great. But the friend who died recently that Doug went to see in hospital mm -hmm. towards the end of his life, um, he, he had cancer. But okay. that came about really because we go and see friends in hospital that Doug works with um, in other environments. So if anybody in the care home for the elderly or any of the children that we visit at school become sick and become going to hospital, then we go and see them. But a therapy dog in a hospital environment is really, really challenging because there are many absolutely crucial areas um, of antibacterial cleansing, um, sure. yeah. infection control, um, mm -hmm. So to prepare a dog to go for a hospital visit takes a long time. You know, it often can take longer to prepare a dog for a hospital visit yes. than the visit itself actually lasts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and do you find that people are generally open to um, you know therapy dogs in the UK? Is it very common? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and um, they don't have any professional status, so it doesn't give them any license to go to places that assistance dogs go to. Okay. Um, so companion animal therapy is, is just that, you know, okay. he's not my therapy dog. He's not my emotional assistance dog. So if I went anywhere that had restrictions on accessibility for um, service dogs only, Doug wouldn't be allowed unless he was sure. specifically going to see somebody in a working capacity. Okay. Sure. Yes. All right. So, so there is a difference between a, um, a assistance dog and a therapy dog. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, there is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times people that don't know will use the term interchangeably or maybe think that it's the same thing. Yes. And sometimes people message us actually quite regularly say, saying, I want one of those because it means that I can take them on planes. I can go on holiday. I can take them into restaurants. And I say, well, actually, that's really not how it works for yeah. 
I don't have any right of access to anywhere that I didn't beforehand. And I would mm -hmm. only have a right of access with Doug if he was specifically on duty to go and see somebody in the environment that I was trying to gain access to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Yeah. And I think, you know, people should respect that. Uh, you know, the animals at the end of the day and we need to give them that kind of respect and not abuse that. Use them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And likewise with Doug, you know, not working every day. And also um, he, when he is working, he, he will only work for maybe two hours at a time, absolute max. That um, being emotionally engaged is challenging. It's tiring. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, you know, people think, well, what's he doing? He's just lying yeah. on his lap. <laughs> if he's emotionally engaged in a place that smells different, looks different, you know, somebody who behaves differently, then, um, you know, that that is working. So we have to respect and value that so that Doug isn't um, misused in any way. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think um, any working dog, regardless of whether they're doing physical work um, or not, I think even the mental stimulation that uh, Doug gets through uh, these interactions with people is, is as much hard work as um, any other working dog that's doing physical labor. Yeah, well, we all know that when we are um, intellectually challenged, um, that can actually be quite exhausting. You know, we don't have to be in physical activity to be yes. tired. Mm -hmm. be tired by um, emotional engagement or cognitive interaction. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's the same for people as well as, uh, as animals. Yeah, I think more yeah. so for animals as well, right? Uh, Doug is a pretty small dog, <laughs> so I'm sure he gets exhausted pretty easily <laughs> and he needs well, time he, man he manages to nap in between things very well he recharges <laughs> his batteries very easily and dogs Great. always do don't they they're very good at recharging <laughs> themselves so he's well adapted and he's uh you know he has his time management and everything sorted out <laughs> he's mastered that yeah he's mastered it <laughs> that's so that's so great that's so wonderful so so Kate you know unfortunately we're running out of time we have about you know five or seven minutes left um so so I'm just gonna see if there's any other questions that people are asking specifically okay. um maybe we could take one or two questions um so let's see um, someone is asking, Pixie Duster Star is asking, does your, um, does your temperament ever affect Doug's? So maybe does your, does your mood affect his mood? Um, I don't think that it does because um, I'm never in a position where I'm really angry or really sad or I have a pretty peachy life where everything's just generally quite the same. So... I think that if I was angry or I was really sad, I think that um, Doug would certainly um, clock into that. Um, yes. So I, I do genuinely believe that dogs do tune into that. Um, yes. But he's, he's, he's fortunate and I'm fortunate that everything's really quite mainstream here, really. You know, nothing, there are no dramas, really. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah sure and you know it's that mutual understanding that you have with him and that relationship that bond which I think is is so special mm. <laughs> great so we have people commenting um saying oh I love your dog <laughs> <How cute. Thank laughs> uh, someone says kudos to your dedication um <laughs> and um some Oscars, Oscar Frenchy Pug says he does an excellent job with you, Kate. Oh, he's he's a good pal of ours. Yeah, <laughs> great. We know Oscar well. Joining in, that's that's amazing. That's that's really so great. Um, <laughs> so so I think you know we probably just um, just end the session soon, and um, you know I just wanted to ask you, Kate, do you have any messages that we can leave our viewers with? Um, anything really that you'd like to share? Well, as all charities are really struggling at the moment to just try and hang on to um, being on people's radar and, um, and, and be at the forefront of people's minds. So, you know, if there is a charity that you hold dear to you, um, please just, you know, 
help spread the word and, and, and share what it is that they do and give any donation that you possibly can that you can afford. Because even if it's just, you know, a teeny, teeny amount, if, it, if a lot of people did that, it would certainly clock up and help charities enormously. I know that pets as therapy are finding it very difficult to keep on people's radar and just, you know, not get forgotten about, particularly at the time that we're unable to work. So mm -hmm. um, that's great. And also, um, there are always more need for therapy dogs than there are dogs and okay. cats. So, sure. you know, we'd love, but we'd love more people to think that they could do what we do too. Yes, I think yeah. um, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah. And and you know, to our viewers, if you if you guys want some more information uh, about some of the uh, causes and charities that uh, Doug and Kate. Uh, are linked to you can go to their website which is dougtheparktherapydog dot com. Yeah. Uh, I think they should be able to find a lot of information on there oh, yeah. uh, with regards to the work you do, um, your book as well. So yeah. so don't forget guys to um, make a donation, a five dollar a five five pound donation um, to pets therapy. To pets as therapy mm -hmm. and uh, send a screenshot to Kate and Doug and uh, they should be able to send you a copy of their book. Yeah. I'm happy to do that internationally as well. Yeah. Great. That's that's so nice of you, Kate, like to do it at, at a time right now as well, you know, where there's a pandemic and, you know, things are so uncertain. Um, it's really, really nice of you uh, both to be continuing on with your work and so dedicated. It's really, really beautiful to hear about your story. Oh, well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity <laughs> to talk today with you. Yes, absolutely. It's been so, so great to have you guys. And, uh, you know, Doug does some amazing, amazing work. And uh, I just want to wish you guys all the best for the future. And, you know, looking forward to more updates on his Instagram page, which has more than 20,000 followers, I think. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. He's, he's really, truly famous. Um, so, so that's great. Awesome. Thank you to all our viewers for, for joining in. And, uh, you know, definitely do check out Doug the Pug's uh, Instagram page and uh, check out their website as well uh, to reach out to them. And thank so, you so much, Kate. Yeah. So he's Doug the Pug Therapy Dog. There are lots of Doug the Pugs. Okay. So he's Doug yes. the Pug Therapy Dog. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So Doug the Pug Therapy Dog. And that's the website as well, DougThePugTherapyDog.com. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds great. So great to have you and have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you so much. Bye. Most welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you so much for joining in.